All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to session five of Ignite season two. In the first session, we covered FMCG. The second was all about conglomerates. The third was all about e-commerce, where we had players from uh, Flipkart and Amazon. Uh, the fourth was about all the HRs talking about the summer placements and the final placements in this time. And now we have the first fifth session where we have uh, companies and leaders from finance, banking, and consulting. Welcome, everyone. Before you move on, uh, let me give you the introduction for all four eminent panelists. Uh, let me start with Leah. She is part of chief of uh, chief of staff team at Goldman Sachs in Bangalore. Prior to this role, she worked uh, in the investment banking division of the firm. She is an alum of I am Kozikod, and she did her graduation at St. Xavier's uh, College, Calcutta. The next panelist is Shovik Sen from ICICI Bank. Uh, for past nine years or so, he's in the banking uh, industry and uh, specializes in uh, financial markets domain. He earlier he headed the Eastern Zone for uh, Corporate Market Group. And currently, he's based out of Delhi and handles the treasury relationship for large corporates for in the North Zone. He's an alumnus of IIM Bangalore. The next on the panel is uh, Karthik Pal. He's a management consultant at Kearney, uh, formerly known as AT Kearney. He has advised clients across automotive uh, pharmaceutical industries on procurements, spend optimization, strategic sourcing, and digital transformation. He's an alum of I'm uh, Ahmedabad, a place comer, and uh, he, he did his engineering from uh, IIT Kharagpur. The last on our panel is Harsh Gandhi, a management consultant at McKenzie & Company. He's a, a, an alum uh, of I am now, and he is a CA at heart. Welcome everybody, and uh, it's it's great to to have all of you in this uh, discussion. I'm sure our user would uh, would have uh, uh, would would want to hear from you on all the aspects that we want to discuss. Uh, before we start, in terms of uh, the first question that I have is uh, let's go into these three segments separately. Finance, which is very, very different from maybe banking, which is core, and consulting. So if we can start with Leah, you, if you can give them an understanding of the universe of finance, and then I'll come to Sovey, who can then dive into the banking aspect of it. For sure. Thanks so much, uh, Ankit. And um, I'll get started off. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, so obviously, finance as a domain is very, very vast, as you would imagine. So what I'm going to do is sort of split it up so that it's a little bit more relatable as to products that we've seen, products that you may not have seen, and uh, then delve into a little bit of what Goldman does, which is a very vast range of products in itself. And so we'll be able to cover a fair bit um, uh, fairly quickly. So to begin with, the more obvious parts of finance are obviously the ones that we have seen, right? The ones that we use on a daily basis, like your bank accounts, general banking, your insurance, your um, sort of um, trading and stock markets, as an example. So these are the ones that we may, and mutual funds, et cetera. So these are ones that we are familiar with. So maybe I won't go into that aspect uh, at the moment. Uh, we'll keep that aside because you may be familiar. On the more institutional side, which is where uh, Goldman uh, mostly operates uh, now, is you come into products and services which include investment banking or investment management or asset management, your securities and trading for institutional clients. Uh, then there is your transaction banking for institutional clients, as an example. There's investment research. So there is a large uh, array of products on the institutional side. And I'll just uh, give you a brief introduction about each of these so that going into college, you have a fair idea of what finance as a stream offers. Right. Um, so let's begin with uh, investment banking. That's where I spent uh, three years of the starting of my career in as a banker in uh, Goldman Bangalore. So uh, what investment banks do is basically two things mostly. One is advising your clients on M&A transactions. And the second is working on their financing. Right. So think of um, uh, just for a very quick example, think of any idea, right? You've come up with an idea, you've got this business and uh, you've scaled it up uh, with, you know, your own money, your money from your friends and family, and you need to scale up further, right? But for that kind of uh, scale, you need to tap into some sort of public funding. And at that point you say, okay, I want to do an IPO raising. So that's where an investment bank uh, steps in. 
So IPO is something that uh, the equity capital markets team within an, within an investment bank does. Right. So now you're an, you're a uh, uh, you're a founder. You've um, listed your company and it's grown ten years down the line. It's much bigger and uh, say now you want to acquire another company in a similar domain um, to say diversify in geography as an example right so now you come back to an investment bank and you say all right so this is where i am strategically i want to grow to this size right and obviously there are organic ways of doing it and there are inorganic ways of doing it if you go for the inorganic option which is an m a um, the investment bank is your advisor, financial advisor, who comes and analyzes targets for you, um, analyzes the industry to see what makes sense for you, if it's the right time for an acquisition for you as a company, and um, identify targets, and then uh, you know clo um, negotiations close the deal, and then you acquire a company, and now you're bigger, right? So that's the second thing that the bank does, which is M&A transactions. Now let's go back. Um, Back to financing. A couple of years down the line, again, um, there's COVID, and uh, there is a cash crunch. And now you need to quickly tap into some market without diluting uh, your shares. So then you tap into something which is the debt market, right? And I'm sure Shavik will go into the details of how these are. So, but this is uh, this this is the, one of the financing aspects of uh, banking. So an investment bank again advises you on the debt raisings that you will do for your company, right? So that's the investment uh, banking part. So that's one sort of stream within finance that you will look at. Now you're a successful founder. It's 20 years into your business. You IPO'd your company, sold a bunch of your shares. You're very, very wealthy. You have a lot of money and you don't know what to do with it. So what you do is you have financial advisors who advise you on where to invest your money. Now, that's where something like uh, at Goldman, we have the private wealth management business, which looks at advising high net worth individuals on where to invest their money. Obviously, asset management or any sort of investment management can be for any kind of client. It can be for an institutional client. I could be, uh, I could be the government. I could be a pension fund. I could be a university with a lot of money, which um, obviously when you have that kind of um, uh, well, you don't keep it in a bank. You have to invest. And um, these are financial advisors in investment management or asset management who then step in to advise you for the best kind of returns. So investment management and private wealth is another sort of second stream that you can look at. The third is, um, again, this is, I understand, it's probably showing the um, area of expertise, but trading is obviously another one. Trading can be at a retail level. We all may or may not trade. May or may not trade. Um, in the stock market, institutions do as well. And uh, there are companies and advisors, including Goldman in our uh, global markets division, which help clients formulate uh, trading strategies, as an example, or price products, right? So that's the global markets division of um, Goldman Sachs. And that's another stream of um, sort of work that goes on within finance. The fourth uh, that we can look at is obviously retail banking, which for Goldman is uh, relatively new. It's only started in 2016. It's called Marcus by Goldman Sachs. So this is your everyday retail customer, banking for retail customers, right? Now this is, uh, a lot of it is obviously moving digital and there's a lot of uh, focus on digital um, transformation within these businesses. Goldman, as an example, has the aim of building a digital uh, bank and that's what uh, Marcus by Goldman Sachs is all about, right? So those are kind of our um, key business lines. The other very important one is merchant banking, which in the industry you'd more, pro more uh, popularly called private equity, venture capital, angel investing, that, that spectrum. So that is when you have um, firms, including Goldman, that invest money in various stages of startups. Right. So any startup that you see, you would have seen a list of investors would have invested in it. So those kind of companies are and other uh, and, you know, investments, including venture capital and private equity would be another sort of stream that you can look at within finance, which is institutional. So these are uh, in the very broad um, sort of landscape. These are some of the business. These are our business lines and some key areas that you can focus on within finance. Now, outside of this, if you if you look um, even within Goldman, if I had to give you some examples of really good technical financial skill sets required for some roles, um, 
uh, there are functions such as say equity research which a lot of a uh, lot of banks provide for institutional clients what equity research basically is is that you are looking at um, say sectors and specific companies and providing your sort of outlook on them so there's a lot of analysis you need core technical skills for this and obviously also a flair to be able to write so if that's something that you enjoy equity research research is something that uh, finance provides which is excellent um similarly you also have corporate treasury as a role as an example right so a treasury role if i were to explain it very simply it is imagine you run a bank and you have to give everybody money to run their own business because you have like 10 different businesses and you have to maintain liquidity of your business and you have to meet capital requirements and you have to be net in uh, you have to be mindful of your net interest income right so that's corporate treasury for you similarly you also have risk management for the firm. so these are the kind of broad business line broad sort of things that you could look at within finance so i think um, ankit have uh, taken enough on the very high level <laughs> Uh, no, no I, 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 th I think that was very, very well. Thank you so much, Shia. Coming to you, Shovik, the banking. Shovik, you're on mute. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, thanks, Ankit. Uh, I think Lia uh, has already given a very comprehensive view about the entire gamut of the finance. So coming to the banking, I will take ICICI Bank as an example, and uh, pretty much uh, the other uh, large banks will also have a similar story. So ICICI Bank was formed in 1955, right? Uh, so ICICI Limited was formed in 1955, which was a joint initiative by government of India and World Bank. At that point of time, the organization was a DFI, the Development Financial Institutions, right? And uh, at that point of time, immediately after the independence, the financial system in the country was in a nascent stage and so was the corporate ecosystem also so uh, icic bank at that point of time icic limited sorry it was not a bank at that point of time icic limited focused on project finance and uh, did its bit in nation building a uh, lot of the current large uh, organizations at that point of time was in a very nascent stage and icic was uh, uh, was involved in project financing and subsequently, four decades after the ICC bank was formed, and for a very long period of time, the banking in India has primarily focused on advances, the loans, right? The project financing or long-term loan, as far as the corporate segment is concerned, at least. So that is what the primary focus has been. So of late, there has been a very significant change uh, in that direction. So advances of the asset still remains an important part of uh, banking, but it's one part of the banking. There are several other things. So for example, when a corporate banker approaches a particular client, the corporate banker himself is a bank in his in himself, is a small bank. So he goes with a gamut of banking offering, which we called 360 degree uh, banking, uh, which is not restricted to lending. So you have, uh, of course, the lending is there, but you have so many other things like the investment needs of the corporates. You have the trade services, both domestic as well as cross-border uh, transactions. You have a range of forex uh, advice, uh, forex uh, risk management. Um, so this is uh, at the corporate level. Then there are so many other ecosystem-driven uh, uh, banking, like uh, you capture the salary accounts for all the employees of that particular corporates, then uh, not only at the corporates, you do a little bit of um, backward and forward integration. You go to the vendor financing and dealer financing of the corporate also, uh, so as to the entire uh, value creation at the corporate level and so at the dealer finance uh, level also happens. So that is what currently the role, the role has enlarged significantly over a period of time. Uh, the typical banking uh, that it used to happen in India. Uh, similarly, if I come to the retail segment, there has been a lot of focus on the technology. So the time to market has reduced substantially now. So you have a lot of data analytics, a lot of uh, AI-based uh, uh, analysis. So all the so let's say somebody has a salary account with ICC Bank, you have all the details of the spending habits of that person. And based on that, you can uh, offer an Insta loan, an Insta credit card 
so which is just it will take 30 seconds you can just go to your mobile app within 30 seconds you can uh, apply for a credit card no documentation no signature nothing and in a week's time the credit card will be delivered to you so this kind of uh, innovations are there are a lot of back end processing uh, back end uh, technology uh, behind uh, these things so that is how the uh, banking has uh, developed over a period of time now uh, for somebody at the mba uh, who is joining immediately after the college college there will be various roles that a bank offers so it starts from a corporate banking to uh, there are gamut of roles i think uh, we can come into detail about each of the roles later on but uh, there are a lot of uh, roles coming uh, that uh, everybody individually starts with but eventually somebody who is working in a banking they kind of tend to understand the entire nuances of the business and integrate each other because now the banking is becoming extremely integrated with each other and integrate all the concepts and finally when approach a customer you come up with a very custom uh, tailor made uh, uh, solution uh, which is required which is a financing need of the customer so it's 360 degree banking coupled with lot of your uh, so icic group for example has a life insurance general insurance ibd all the arms are there right so you actually approach with a 360 degree financing to a corporates so that is how the banking has uh, evolved uh, over a period of time and that's i think is the story for all the large uh, banks at this point of time all right thank thanks so much shovik for that detailed uh, dive into the banking space now let me let me come to kartik strategic consulting the the glamour of it what 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 is it all about okay so hi everyone firstly thanks for joining in so consulting if like if we go by the literal meaning of it is to like understand the problem and advise and that's what you do as a consultant so you will have a variety of clients who will have a variety of needs and each client comes with its unique constraints and unique needs and you have to give that client a best fit solution given his constraints and his requirements and the range of your work can like go from working for a like a sme on their procurement or manufacturing needs to like advising the government on how to create the or how to transition to electric vehicles in the country so that is like the scope of work you can do depending on who how who your clients are and what are their needs and so on if you see at a company level every company has can have two distinct type of things one is their scope of industries which can be ranging from automotive financial banking consumer industries etc and the other could be in terms of functions it can be like top line growth your retail pricing and all those things bottom line improvement ebitda improvement digital analytics etc so yeah that's what pretty much consulting is and then i'll be happy to take detailed questions if are there sure sure let me let me come to harsh harsh the the other aspect of consulting is one is advising and the other nowadays is also coming into the picture is uh, uh many big companies want those consultants consultants to be part of the implementation phase as well so yeah. how is both of those aspects very very different so or and and is is that true yeah go on sorry i'm saying is is that true so um to be to just follow kartik's queue right it's simply about taking a problem and solving it how you solve it might be a different question altogether so when you come to a typical strategic consulting you are doing strategy which we typically a new business build or solving for a problem which is very very specific to you whereas in implementation what typically happens is you want the consultants to not only allow the people on the ground to actually implement that strategy but also help them in understanding where they are facing those specific issues so at implementation level a consultant role is much more playing that Uh, playing the de bottlenecker of sorts, uh, rather than you know just being the person who leads everything. In strategy, it's typically the consultant who provides those insights because it's always good to have something which is outside in. It's a fresh perspective. Uh, but in implementation, it's always the people on the ground who lead the entire thing, right? So it's just supporting them wherever they need, whenever they need it. So that's the typical difference between a implementation as well as a typical strategy kind of a. 
from what i've seen sure. but uh, to specifically put it put it in perspective today frankly a lot of strategic consultants also do a lot of implementation and that's the need of the r specifically because of this kind of support that the strategic consultants can provide that's about it so both of them are same the two different sides of the same coin actually sure and also on on the thought harsh i would also want to uh, see there is also a question already on uh, uh, i mean how is uh, covid or the current situation changing the way the uh, one i mean i'll i'll just expand on it companies looking at external consultants which is your your business and how consultants are also coping up for this whole thing because many a times you are required to travel as this question is yeah sure so um taking the first question up right honestly consulting in covid has been i would say much much more intense than regular but simply because uh, the clients come to you for a lot of advice and today since there's a lot of uncertainty it's even more impactful if you can give that specific line of thinking if nothing else so today consulting i would say is at a very very good position uh i would say if in terms of uh, you know how consultants are responding to it i would say it's a lot more video calls a day it's a uh, i would say much much more engaging day than usual uh typically you would switch off let's say around 9ish in the evening right now it's tends to be earlier you have much better control of when you want to work but it's been work from home ever since right um, nothing from the client front is except for teams that are helping the government respond to the entire crisis nothing has been on the ground everything is work from home and even in terms of how it's going to go now on it's simply going to be how we progress it's going to be safety first so i don't think consulting uh, will lose that charm because you are still doing the work it's just that it's being done virtually that's it no difference other than that okay okay all right kartik coming to you can you also stress on whether uh, so generally what happens is in all these scenarios when the business is not that up the, the support functions see a budget cuts or let's say something wherein the company needs external help have you have you seen that happening is it is it happening across the con- uh, industry also or rather it's the other way around wherein now they are looking at how to increase their revenues 3x and 4x given the uncertain times kartik yeah so if you could just uh, i couldn't get the question the first part at all because i couldn't hear what harsh was saying so okay. if you could just rephrase the question once sure more. sure 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 so i'm 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 just saying that one element of the question is that uh, uh when in these times when uh, there are mm-hmm. uh, there is al- already pressure on budgets uh, many a times the support functions get cut in terms of the bud- budgetary allocations or any external help that a company needs that's one aspect of it the other aspect to okay. think through is that these are the times when companies actually need uh, external advice in terms of how to grow how to improve top line or how to improve the the profits or so and then they rope in uh, 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 external help like management consultants what's your view i mean what, where is industry moving towards so i think the companies will hire you only when they see value and if you are able to deliver value which is like maybe five times or 10 times the cost is incurred i think it is a win win deal for the company so right now given the situation it is too early to say that if we are moving to any specific direction but yeah uh, what we could hear or see from our partners and all is that clients are approaching us to get our perspectives on how to shape themselves or how to equip themselves for the post covid world and we should see hope to see that continue but again okay. nothing specific we can say right now as to if we are moving in any particular direction so sure. thanks karthik so we're coming to you how is banking is changing in these covid times i see many uh, uh, banks uh, launching e kycs to open up banks which wasn't i mean it was there earlier but it wasn't emphasized as such mm-hmm. no so uh, this is a uh, really a challenging time so there is no denying about the fact so uh, global uh, growth for example imf is projecting some about 4.9% of the growth over a 
over the uh, calendar year and same kind of same number for the uh, country also so about 5% uh, deep growth which is uh, being projected so uh, as far as banking is concerned there is a wide scale cash flow stress within the corporate segments and banking is not insulated from the corporate segments right if there is a wide scale uh, stress in the cash flow in the corporate side banking is bound to be uh, impacted some way or the other uh and of course some of the corporate sectors are relatively less impacted so we have a very clear uh, distinguish between the essentials and non essentials now somebody possibly in the fmcg pharma telecom they are not that impacted but somebody who is in the aviation sector who is in uh, tourism who is in uh, textiles are going to get uh, a severe cash flow issue so there is a wide scale uh, cash flow issue in the market uh government has stepped in to uh, with uh, different uh, kind of supports the regulator has come up with a lot of support so a lot of liquidity uh, measures has been uh, given in the market like the crr has been cut then uh, ltro has been a very uh, nice uh, kind of uh, experiment i would say which is uh, where, where the bank can uh, borrow for a longer tenor at a repo rate and then finally uh, on lend uh, as an ncd structure to the end customer slf mf so various uh, cash flow liquidity measures has been taken by the uh, regulators but having said that there is definitely a credit spread increase there is a risk aversion which is there in the banking industry so that is one side uh, the second side is what you have already touched upon there is a solid push on the digital transformation which was anyway going on in the banking industry but the, this has kind of accelerated it uh, many fold so uh, coming to icici bank so the moment this crisis this was uh, unanticipated crisis right so the moment it happened immediately the bank has taken step for employees the customers and a lot of internal controls so for employees for example there has been a large scale work from home so if there are people who are not based out of branches the branches could not be shut down obviously but people who are not based out of branches have started working from home which is kind of unimaginable in banking right banking is where face to face everything happens face to face so un, uh, work from home in banking is pretty uncommon a large scale work from home has been initiated there has been a lot of uh, time and effort invested on training and uh, development a cross functional training among the employees there has been a lot of uh, health care support so the organization has treated it with empathy but at the same time it has been ensured that customers are not impacted at all so uh, there is something called we call icc stack right it's a term which uh, basically says uh, stack means a start so start is something when the customer just on gets onboarded then transact avail then avail is facilities loans and all then care is all the insurance products and then keep growing all your investment needs and your kids education things like that so that is the life cycle of a customer in the bank and from this start to keep growing the entire value chain everything has been kind of majority of the work can be done online now so for last 3 4 months for example the corporate banking is work, uh, working without much people going into the brand, uh, going into the offices but still the banking is continuing so everything is happening online so for the retail customers for example whatsapp banking Uh, is something that the bank has started there are mobile atm vans uh, in the containment uh, zones for the corporate customers there is a mobile app instabis so regulators has also kind of supported so regulators have now allowed uh, cross border transactions using mobile app so we have an mobile app instabis which is for all your trade transactions uh, that can be done over a uh, click of a mobile uh the banking is full of documentation right there are a lot of checks and balances there are a lot of uh, documentation so a uh, lot of it is being done using digital signature using um even now we are moving towards online franking so there are a lot of stamp paper requirements so that also uh, we are moving uh, moving towards online franking uh then something like a cardless cash withdrawal which is i think very typical to uh, it's a uh, nice initiative that icici bank has done that uh, when you withdraw your uh, cash from atm you don't really need your card so during this period uh, there are a lot of times people don't want to go to the atm but still need cash so without uh, using the debit card you can authenticate a particular transaction and uh, whoever is required to uh, take that cash he can go to the atm and withdraw the cash the person does not need to go to atm himself 
for uh, taking the cash out and giving to somebody so that's a cardless uh, cash transaction so this kind of things has uh, got a solid push and uh, larger acceptability by the customers also so quite a few things were there already but people were possibly not uh, exploring that they were not checking this is also this feature is also there now now uh, it's uh, the necessity so that is how a lot of these things have got a solid push at the uh, same time there has been a lot of internal controls also the it infrastructure uh, we are kind of ready to uh, technologically we are kind of al already ready so that's why this kind of a uh, surge in digital transaction has not failed our infrastructure the it infrastructure is ready with that there are a lot of security control is required because a lot of critical employees are working from home so need a lot of security uh, uh, control on that i think we lost him okay uh uh yeah, i, I think. think i lost something yes yes for last 10 seconds please go on is it we can hear you audible now? now okay 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 yeah. so uh, so yeah so that is what i was saying that uh, so for example traditionally the trade services uh the entire banking used to have a multiple visit to bank for example a normal uh, cross border transaction you uh, for the payment instruction you needed to go to the branch and then post the payment is process which typically takes one to two days because it's a cross border payments which involves multiple geographies multiple banks involved from uh, the start to the end beneficiary so after the payment is finally effected the documents are to be collected so now something like an insta uh, payment on a for a cross border transaction has been uh, uh, initiated and uh, transaction has been already matlab we have already start this so these are the typically lot of uh, such there are a lot of such examples so uh, particularly in the transaction banking side and both on the uh, corporate banking side so uh, sure. so this is the positive side of the uh, if i have to say so uh, that we have uh, seen over the last 3 4 months of time all right thanks thanks over coming to you lia uh, the investment banking and the other divisions have they seen any impact of course so in terms of uh, in terms of business if i were to take an example i would probably quote um, uh, you know something from investment banking so as you can imagine obviously banking uh, in terms of mna has dropped significantly it's about 50% lower to the level that was last year even in india it's much significantly lower and um, obviously last year was was a record year in india but even uh, notwithstanding that so um deals are still happening obviously you would have seen facebook geo you would have seen uh, adp gmr airports in india itself um, these are some transactions that have gone through there's obviously the reliance rights issues as well the interesting part and also this is also quite intuitive is that is across the world globally also and in india you have seen finance step in significantly to have um, sort of um, plug the gaps in liquidity that uh, shobik was talking about because there is so much of a cash flow crunch uh, businesses are really having to tap into markets to sort of tide through this crisis and uh, if you look at uh numbers in india as an example it's twice of what it was last year in equity issuances similarly for ig investment grade issuances it was um twice of what was it, uh, the level that it was last year right and um around the same levels for high yield as well so that's that's what happened so far in terms of the forward so mna um in what the firm is seeing as the recovery period uh, is probably like we think of it in sort of three phases the first phase is obviously going to be you will have your distress sales you'll have your um, you know that that sort of uh, segment getting covered which i think we're coming to the end of we're more in the near in sort of uh, mna is um, happening where your uh, transactions are within the industry within the com uh, country more local um and maybe towards the end of the year we'll start seeing more of cross border maybe not to the levels that it was previously at but definitely increasing right um so that's and any like if you think of recovery with an mna it obviously depends on how much cash is there in the system in terms of investment so if you look at um private equity i think it's around 2 trillion dollars that uh, private equity is holding on to right now right and there's um, so there's there is cash that ha can be invested by investors so 
when things get better, maybe towards the end of the year or early next year, we can see sort of a pickup. In terms of very high level themes that come, it's probably, um, I'd call it three maybe. So the importance of business resilience previously, and that also in making investment decisions, right? So do you think about how diversified your supply chain as an example is in terms of business resilience when you're buying another company? So that's, that's one example. And um, second, obviously, is how um, and um, how ESG as a focus, that's sustainability, so that's environmental, social, and uh, governance focus areas, right? That's actually grown so much. And it's, like Shavik said earlier, all of these things already existed, but it's definitely, you can see an accelerated uh, adoption in the last uh, couple of months, um, especially in ESG, the social aspect, because now everybody's concerned about how you're treating your employees, how you're... Uh, how the companies you've invested in are treating their employees, shareholders are holding companies accountable for things like this, right? So that's definitely on the ESG part and uh, already all of you covered on the digital you know, transformation and that's definitely been accelerated as well. So these are these are kind of the top things in the forward that I see for um, sure. coming out of COVID. Sure. Leah, because you mentioned about certain profiles earlier, there was a question and this, this person has been posting it uh, again and again. So difference between the PE firms, IB firms, hedge funds, if you can just in about two minutes, because everybody, I'm, sh I'm sure very few of our users would know between them. And this is between ICC Bank and GS. If you can take this up very quickly. For sure. All right. So um, all of these are different streams of finance. Uh, Goldman is an example has and many of the other banks have all of these services right now pe firms are basically if um i will take i will use uh, goldman as an example because i know that uh, closest our mbd business um invests money in different companies so say there is a stake in say we invest in any new startup as um, as an angel investor or a late late stage investor as an example right so that's what a PE firm does. Um, IBs are, again, investment banking. Um, we discussed about this in a little bit more detail. So I'm assuming that is clear. It's mostly M&A and financing. Financing is your equity capital markets and your debt capital markets. right? So that's on the uh, IB side. Uh, then you had asset management. right? So if I'm an asset manager, I will have several portfolios under me. So I will have a lot of clients. It may be institutional clients. It may be private wealth, um, you know, high net worth individuals. So these are my clients. They invest in funds that I have or funds of funds. There are like different structures that you can follow. And it is my job to basically take this pool of money and invest it in different um, sectors, different companies. So that's what asset management does. In Within that, a lot of your work will be basically, um, and this is long-term, you've invested money, right? And, it's, and at some point, they're going to take it out. They're going to sell sell their uh, stake in the company. So you have to keep monitoring their returns. Be ensure uh, You have to ensure that you're delivering alpha for the client. Okay, so that's asset management. And uh, sorry, remind me, what was the last one? Equity research, right? So as an equity researcher, Equity research, right? Uh, equity research. What you do basically is, uh, you would we would we have all actually seen this uh, on CNBC as an example, right? We always have people coming and saying this is what we we expect the target price of say Reliance to be at I don't know whatever uh, INR, right? So somebody's done the fundamental analysis of of Reliance, looked at the industry, looked at the forward to the industry. You do a bunch of projections and you come to a target price. Um, in the first year of MBA, you will have uh, financial accounting and uh, valuation and all of that stuff. So you will learn how to do all of this. But you basically value companies, which is sim very similar to what you do in investment banking. Except here, you give a price for a um, you give a price for a stock, as an example. That's one of the things that you do in equity research. Another thing is, um, if you read these equity research reports, they do a lot of analysis on sectors. So you have you can be a uh, sector specialist instead of um, you know specific stocks so that's like the tactical research part and or like macroeconomics how is asia looking so you can be an asia specialist so that's kind of what equity research does i hope that um answers to some extent sure. yeah. no no i think i think that that was good 
let me come to the different aspect now and which i i'm sure all the users would be interested to know and i'll come to you harsh uh, first so uh, let, let's take uh, all the all our users through the profile that your company offers okay the skill sets that they see in those profiles and the training programs that they have which is either the stints or one year long program or six months whatever that is just to ensure that that person whom they have recruited is put on a path to success we'll start with you arch and then we'll we'll go in that sir sure so uh, in the first question of terms of profile consulting specifically you don't really have a big play in terms of which profile is specific for this kind of a job right you require as quickly put problem solvers so you can be an engineer you can be someone who's done commerce you can be a rocket scientist you can be a analytics person does not really matter at the end of the day if you are good at problem solving that's about it that's all that matters for this uh, this specific kind of a job in terms of the skill sets yes uh, in addition to problem solving what is also expected is that you can have some amount of you know communication skills which are pretty much built up because at the end of the day in consulting what is expected is from day one you will be put in front of clients so while you might want to get that knowledge in you will definitely get that knowledge in via a lot of different sources but you will be put in front of clients and you should be able to present yourself and clients very quickly so those are the two specific skill sets i would say are work wonders in consulting uh, in terms of uh, you know if i'm looking at type of training programs etc are available so typically before you go into a specific engagement anywhere in consulting you are always given a bunch of things to understand the context basically if i am doing let's say doing some chemicals company helping them become the digital leader in their entire uh, for me what important to know is the company is all about what their operations are what are they doing where are they doing this entire becoming number about etc also in addition to that what i need to know is you know what i what with the thing that i on how quickly can i get to sit on that as well so you have a lot of resources on this you have in the form a lot of fire already done and that is a very good starting point to talk to like you can have a 10 minute chat and you can understand whatever you are supposed to in addition to that you also have a lot of these training programs which train for specific sectors or specific functions right and these are just one of ones right even if i want to want everything about banking yes i won't keep that within an hour let's say if i'm working on a retail piece i understand what the bank actually does so my voice audio yeah. yeah yeah hush hush it's it's cracking in between Uh, what I'll do okay. is I'll I'll go to Karthik and come to you again. In the meanwhile, you can sort of oh, get sure, your words. Sure, sure. Karthik, yeah, if yeah. you want to take 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 it forward from there. So Ankit, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, actually, there's some technical issue. I'm not able to hear what Harsh is saying. So if you could just no, summarize no, 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 it so, so that I know. So 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 basically, what we were talking about was that what kind of profiles uh, uh, strategic companies like Kerni uh, offer on campuses. what is the kind of skill sets uh, uh, are you looking for when you are hiring those consultants and what is the kind of training programs uh, a, a new person in that company or in your got company it, go it. through so you can you can stick to uh, karni and then take it forward understood understood so for karni also the core profile is of a management consultant uh, which is we call it as a general practice so that will be the most of the consultants or the bulk of the hiring then there are two specific profiles one is in digital transformation and other is in analytics which is also uh, for which also the hiring happens core skills which are people are looking for is one your communication skills which has to be very like very sharp and confident communication skills second will be your core analytical skills and the level of that will vary uh, depending on the role for which you are being offered as well as the level at which you are uh, being taken 
and the third will be your uh, like core consulting skills which we say in terms of your project management client management and all again uh, the way you will be tested for it will differ and the expectations will differ basis uh, the level at which you are entering so if you are entering at a uh, analyst level senior business analyst which we say in kali's terminology your expectation will be more towards communication and analytics while you will be expected to learn the client and the project management thing on the go while if you are coming at a more senior level like uh, a manager or even senior than that then uh, the, you will have to be very good and the client management part will also hold me coming to the training program so company organizes a variety of training programs at different levels mostly it is linked to the time the project uh, trajectory you are follow in the firm so as a senior business analyst you have something a training program just as you enter within the first 6 months and then close to every promotion just before or after that you have a uh, training programs which will impart you skills uh, which will be more suitable to help you with that uh, particular uh, designation or the responsibilities associated with that designation just to give an example so when we entered uh, the training program we had was uh to help us with our analytic skills so it included some modules on pop, uh, problem solving and how to present your analysis in a uh, refined way how to uh, derive the key insights and we also had another training program like another sessions on our body language the presentation skills how to handle difficult client situations and so on. okay all right thanks karthik uh, coming back to you harsh i think the voice should be okay now Yeah, this is better now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Go ahead. You you were you were talking about the training programs that we can see. Yeah. So uh, as Scott expected, there are internal programs. Yes. Uh, but uh, something which is a lot in the consulting basically is one on one. You know, on the uh, topic that you know. Sorry, you are hush, hush, hush. Sorry, it's cracking again somehow. I mean, uh, maybe I'll one or two. Just... Yeah, I'll just join back. I'll just join back. I'm not sure what. Sure, sure, sure. No, no problem at all. So, uh, I mean, I'll I'll come to Harsh later. Uh, I'll go to Savik in that sense. Uh, Savik, again, if you can uh, give a perspective from the ICIC Bank in terms of the profile, the skill sets, and the training programs that are in place. Okay. So, uh, so the bank has so many divisions. So every uh, there are a lot of uh, different uh, roles which uh, we offer in a campus, and uh, it's not. constant in all the campuses there it kind of varies uh, between one campus to another also but uh, largely there is a wholesale banking group which is uh, basically an end to end banking for the large corporate so this uh, group deals with the banking need for a large uh, corporate uh, then you have a international banking group so international banking group is primarily the international subsidiaries of the domestic corporate so about that is where about international so icic bank has uh, presence in some 19 uh, different countries so one of the largest uh, among the indian banks and uh, so this particular profile is uh, focused towards the uh, subsidiaries uh, so indian linked uh, businesses the overseas locations um, you have commercial banking group commercial banking group is primarily focused on the uh, transaction basically the transaction banking group so they are focused on a day to day transactions uh, cross border transactions domestic transactions lc opening things like that then all the trade finance products uh, you have a whole gamut of uh, trade financing products which this team uh, takes care of then you have markets group where i have been working for uh, last uh, several years so markets group uh, particularly focuses on uh, your uh, so there are a uh, couple of uh, divisions within markets group again so there is one uh particular role is that which is a uh, trading role so you trade uh on the bank's behalf there are so many uh, different asset class on which you trade there is uh, equity there is foreign exchange different currencies you have rate trading you have option trading derivative trading you have uh, something in bullion so there are so many asset class on which you trade so this is one role which is a trading purely a trading role then there is a huge uh, amount of customer facing role here so where the customers uh, financial markets related risk is to be managed uh, for example if i take an example of a foreign currency so india's balance of payments if i look at the balance of payments which is basically the import export 
services export the fdis that is coming in the country the foreign portfolio level investors so the actual underlying balance of payment level the flow is more than 2 trillion dollar in a year so that is the kind of foreign exchange transactions happens uh, in the country and this is the underlying flow there is a lot of churning over uh, this volume so there is a huge amount of foreign exchange risk that all the indian corporates run so uh, this markets group professionals are take care of that uh, there are different hedging strategies uh, or there there are dealings in this foreign exchange then apart from foreign exchanges there are a lot of uh, structured funding solutions like uh, you can borrow through debt capital market to an ncd you can borrow through commercial papers you can borrow through external commercial borrowings you can uh, borrow through fcnrb deposits of course you can borrow as a normal simple to rupee term loan so all these structured funding solutions so these are the things that markets group professionals work with then you have uh, similarly sme ag group which which takes care with, with the sme small medium uh, enterprises this is similar to wholesale banking group they just take care of the sme size corporate of course you have retail banking you have human uh, resource you have a risk management uh, group which is the basically the risk assessment for all the exposures that the bank takes on the corporates so there are again within the rng there are risk management group there are some team who focuses on the large corporates some team focuses on the sme corporates so then you have uh, technology and digital group there are a lot of the icic bank has been pioneered in technology so there are a lot of focus on technology so a lot of people with a technology background also comes in the technology and digital group so broadly these are the roles as far as the training is concerned uh, when somebody joins he joins as a management trainee from a campus uh, person joins as a management trainee there is a one year probation period during the probation period we whoever joins in that department typically during this one year period they will continue in this uh, particular department only and they will learn on the job there are so many uh, mentoring uh, programs there are a lot of training programs within one year people tend to learn what uh, this particular department is what the specific job is uh, so somebody in wholesale banking group will start understanding the credit somebody in the markets will start focus on the financial markets so this one year is uh, more for a learning perspective and uh, typically a lot of hand holding happens during this one year from the second year onwards uh, it's uh, on the job learning the continuous process continues and uh, subsequently there is a lot of internal movements also that also happens so it is not that somebody who joins in a particular role remains in that role forever it of course is some individual choice but there is something called we call ojp which is an open job posting which is an internal uh, lateral hiring uh, so as to say and uh, every uh, year uh, a lot of such uh, requirements gets posted and people who are interested to move from let's say markets group to commercial banking commercial banking to treasury so all those uh, that ojp uh, program takes care of that so yeah broadly that sure. so we got the thought i mean the ojp program because um, i mean I, i wanted to ask that as a separate question but uh, when the learning shifting is happening and that might be true for the other panelists as well from i mean according to you when that shift makes sense when when does it make sense to shift from let's say uh, treasury to retail banking or retail banking to maybe investment banking if at all that can be done if yes then ideally what is the best time i mean should you do it at a leadership position my my sense is no but should we should you do it in let's say 3 to 4 years into that whole mp program i'm not sure so what's your sense as to when it should be done and how so there is no hard and fast rule as such a uh, lot of people has continued in one department for a very long period of time and they have moved from one department to other department at a uh fairly at a mid mid management uh, kind of a role instead of 3 4 years so a lot of people have moved uh, not absolutely at the senior management level obviously at uh, so over a period of time in banking what happens is you start with specialization and you move towards generalization because as i said the banking has become very integrated so one particular role may not remain very very focused on that role so when you are working on markets you 
need to understand the entire banking need of a corporate then only you will come with a proper solution that the customer needs it's not in a very narrow sense restricted only to markets so over a year when you work on a particular role you kind of get a sense of what the other businesses are you obviously you get uh, involved in the other businesses uh, that's the nature of the business so over a period of time possibly uh, so a lot of people there is no rule that after 3 years you should move but generally the ojp uh, is offered after somebody has uh, continued on a particular role at least for 2 years so it cannot be done very frequently that you have joined a role and without understanding the role in 6 months you want to shift so you have to work on a particular role for 2 years and after 2 years if you feel that this particular role is suitable for me then it's a uh, both way matching so there is again an internal interview that happens and if it works out then people shift so sure. that is how the okay. ojp program works thanks thanks avay i'll come to you harsh again before i move to lia you were talking about again sure. the internal training programs yeah sorry uh, some tech issues on my side but no uh, i think this, this is this is good yeah now it's good. Yeah. 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 yeah yeah so uh, in terms of training programs right so you typically have a lot of these 101s which happen which is basically while you are getting into let's say a retail banking kind of a project you if you have zero background of it even then within an hour an hour and a half max you can get a very quick ramp up into that specific sector into that specific domain as such so you have a lot of these programs which are available at the one click kind of a thing in addition to that you also have these specific programs which happen from time to time as karthik mentioned right typically at a 6 month or a 3 month kind of a tenure uh, where which focuses a lot on ensuring that one whatever skill sets in terms of soft skills need to be upgraded will do get upgraded and also you get an update in terms of what's happening within the industry as well so for example a lot of folks like let's say if i'm doing something which is related to banking but this entire geo platform geo platform facebook kind of a deal which happened if you want to get a download into it you actually have these sessions which happen across the form anyone can join in just get a download on what is happening plug out within 10, 10 minutes that doesn't matter but it's a very good kind of an insight which you get within the form itself so it's a form knowledge which gets created and at the end of the day all of this is codified right so you have documents which put a lot of this information out there and you can read it anywhere whenever you want whenever you are getting into a new engagement etc so i think it's typically the training programs in consulting much more a focus on you know developing your skill set but there are a lot of these do like do your own kind of a thing which works a lot very well in your getting a ramp up on your engagements kind of a scenario okay all right also uh, i remember uh, the last time uh, we had such a program there was also a uh, emphasis that the mckenzie and I, i think kurni also does it during the recruitment itself there is workshops that the consulting firms do to train the uh, the people who will go through the interview process so that training happens actually before the interview process what what yeah. i mean how how does it go through and why why the training happens by the company to the shortlisted candidates who are to be interviewed who are yet to be interviewed because sure. that, that's, that's that's something which is which is very very great yeah so this is a process which typically i mean i consider this unique to a lot of consulting companies themselves uh the major outcome of this process or the key takeaway that i have taken why this process being done it's basically that the candidate needs to feel as confident as possible when they are doing the interview right and what i mean by feeling this confidence is while you might have the technical skill sets in you based on whatever you have learned till now at the end of the day in consulting you need to be able to apply that and also give a presentable output in front of anyone who's in front of you typically partners who take an interview who are actually at cxo level equivalence right so the biggest push is that one you need to be confident about whatever you are speaking second it's also about the fact that a lot of people are while it's a nuance about problem solving that a, that a lot of people do not understand but it's problem solving is something that you can do only after a lot of practice 
and in order to do that practice it always helps to have perspective so while i can solve one problem in one manner if someone with a different perspective or a different diverse background at itself comes in and gives a different perspective on it right it's a huge huge plus for me and that's what that specific process wants you to explore because at the end of the day i am someone who's a candidate who's a ca who's done a lot of finance so i have one particular mindset but the moment i start interacting with folks who are not from that background or who are from a diverse background altogether it helps my problem solving toolkit and that's something that i can present in front of the partners as well so it's a balance between presenting yourself and also gaining confidence about what you are okay all right thanks thanks ash coming to you leah uh, the roles the skill sets and the training programs for gs sure so i think the roles mostly i've covered uh, it's investment banking asset management there's research there's trading there's uh, treasury and there's risk so these are basically the divisions where um, for which we hire from campuses at the analyst level so that's an overview of what the roles are in terms of skill sets um an understanding a strong understanding actually of the of the fundamentals of finance is is absolutely required right or um even the ability even if you show the ability of being able to think through some of those even that is fine because obviously people would have had different kinds of exposure you know some may have um, gone through financial statements out of interest or some may have studied it as a subject and some may not have seen it at all um so you know b school that way is a great leveler in that you have some time before um, at least a summer placement starts uh, where you can um, come to you know come to speed with the basics of finance and if if you are seriously looking at a career in finance this is absolutely non negotiable right you need to be able to read financial statements and you need and when i say read financial statements it doesn't mean knowing where say um a sudden increase in fixed asset assets goes in like your cash flow statement but being able to connect that through and seeing what that actually means for for the bottom line of your business what does that mean going forward does it imply does it impact any of the multiples when you're valuing companies etc like things like this right so you have to be able to make certain connects and i think that is the piece that some of us miss when we are studying for especially when you're studying for exams and you think i just need to know okay what comes where um you know and don't necessarily connect the dots or make an effort to connect the dots when we're studying i think that is a piece that um if you guys focus on that is super helpful so fundamental finance is great in uh, that's on the technical side obviously on obviously there are um, skill sets that both um fashion darling mentioned around communication and being able to articulate which is super important uh, one thing i've seen i think it's probably like it's great if you can practice it and b school is a great time to see that but uh, one thing which sounds very simple is to be present in discussions and that by that i mean putting your 100% uh, thought and attention into every discussion that you're part of being able to imbibe the information distill it and sort of get a point of view of your own and not not echo what other people are saying right so distill that information have a point of view and if that's what you think is right have a discussion around your point of view and get everybody to a consensus right so being able to do things like this i feel like nobody tells you before you get into b school that you might need some of these skills going into work um but like i'm just i'm just talking obviously out of my experience yeah. i was somebody yeah. told me <laughs> but uh, these are these are things that that are super important right and uh, training programs personally this is very close to me because even um, as it, when i was in ibd i was involved with uh, developing and executing on training programs for interns and new hires right it's so important to get your basics right and uh, goldman across the across the street has one of the best training programs um and i can speak for banking i've been through it and um, it's intense uh, you you cover everything you need to know it's super technical but it also gives you the basis for, with which to take forward a career in finance right especially across each of these segments that i spoke about so there are training programs and um, you're at the beginning you're always or always you'll be um, shadowing uh, another analyst or associate or vp so you see how work is done so there is uh, there is a lot of learning on the job but there is also very very intensive um, training program that we do on on the job 
Sure. Leah, also, I mean, the same question that I asked Shavik, uh, how about flexibility of switching between roles with, uh, between divisions within GS? That actually is uh, quite common. I am, I am an example. I spent about three and a half years in banking. Then I moved into the CEO's office, right? So it's, and um, internal mobility is very common in Coleman. It's something a lot of people opt to do. Um, to your second question that you'd asked uh, Shavik also on wh what is the right time, I I don't know, like he said, I don't know if there's a right time, but I do think that some, there is a threshold that you need to cross to have learned enough about a business to say, okay, now I think I can see something else. If you, if you think of moving within the first year or even the first year and a half, I feel like you're not giving it your all and you haven't taken everything you can from it. So I think my advice would be to spend at least a fair amount of time, maybe two and a half, three, four, five. After I don't think it's ever too late uh, to explore something um, outside of what you've always done. But I do think that if you've started in a particular division, you can have other interests. That, that's great. Um, and it's within finance. So it, the more you see, it's just knowledge building, right? And it all gives you more context about the industry as a whole. Um, but it's important to spend some amount of time before you move to, you know, you sort of hop across. Yeah. Uh, one aspect uh, that many people, I was just going through the comments, everybody wants to get into consulting. Hey, how should I get into consulting? You don't come to our college, all of that. But more important question is, is consulting for you? I mean, it, it looks very, very glamorous and that, that that is true for the other profiles as well. And that's why people do shift after a year or two or leave the company or so. Uh, how should they identify whether a profile or industry or a company is best suited for them? Because they have few months to go before their summers. They have a year and a half to go, maybe two years before they come for their placements. How should they identify the, the profile, the industry, and the company. Okay. So uh, let me bring two perspectives. Here. One uh, from my perspective of like from the consulting point of view and the other, my perspective as a placement committee member. So I think it will cover the entire breadth of it. So starting with the placement committee point of view, so one of the most underrated things in the campus is uh, PPTs. So PPTs are actually seen as a like a burden for like the students. They like why we are wasting time attending PPTs, and the only thing they look forward to is the free food at the end of it. But PPTs are actually a great source of like information if you use it correctly. So if you actually spend time there, even like you spend five, 10, 15 minutes knowing talking to the people who have like flown in. It's a lot of work and let me tell you here, like if they're flown into campus one day, the work doesn't stop. So it's like they have actually taken a time to like actually come there and share the experiences with you. And most of the B schools end up getting people across the level. So there'll be like partners or CXO level people, there'll be mid management people and there'll be the new people who have just joined the firm a year or two before. So it's actually a good opportunity to know what, how the trajectory looks like within the firm, what the firm does, how the experience of those people has been, and then try to match it with your interest and whatever expectations from uh, whatever career you plan to choose. In consulting, it becomes slightly easier because you have this buddy program, which was Ankit was mentioning as the training before the interviews. So we call it the buddy program or the mentorship program, where uh, you get at least one or two buddies, depending on the firm and their policies, who are at different levels within the firm. So one person can be a just entry level analyst, another would be someone who is a mid management person. And then as you progress within the process, you also get an opportunity to interact with the partners and more senior people in the firm. So that helps you answer both your questions, one, whether the consulting is for me or not, whether it is for me right now or not, whether it is only for short term or whether it is for the long term. So if you use these interaction opportunities judiciously, I think there's no better way to like help you make the decision. Okay. All right. Thanks, Karthik. Coming to you, Harsh, in your opinion, is there anything else that a student should be looking at apart from the pre-placement talks? Um, so 
So, in order to identify yourself for consulting specifically, frankly, couple of things, right? So, one, you need to understand what you are going to be doing as a consultant, and that's something which is very, very hazy out today, right? A lot of people do not know how the day of a consultant really looks, and especially in this COVID time, which has slightly shifted a lot, right? Once they understand that, I think it's a very good source of and whether you actually want to do that kind of work, whether you do not want to do that kind of work, or you are, as Karthik said, you want to do it for the short term or the long term. I think that's one big thing. And the second, typically, is actually connecting folks who are within the firm, uh, outside of the, not necessary that these come firms come to your campus or not, right? It's always good to connect to folks who are within these firms because at the end of the day, what you are going to understand as your profile is you might be your engineer who like has amazing things who has done amazing things in your entire world and yet a lot of people are not able to get into consulting simply because they are not a good fit or they think consulting is not a good fit for them but how they find that is specifically through i personally believe that just about understanding the people who are doing this as of now understanding why they are doing it i think that typically where you find your source of inspiration whether you want to do it. Sure. Also, uh, Sawai, coming to you, uh, when Karthik mentioned about pre-placement talks, isn't pre-placement talks only about the the good part about the company or the industry or so? Right? They, they I mean, they, they might take a good uh, employee story or a brand story. And, and that, that is true for every company. If a student wants to really do a reality check, or get, dive into the different aspects of the role. So in a PPT, that might be for about 60 minutes or 90 minutes. They definitely can't get into the roles. I mean, they, they will get a, a broader sense about the company, where it operates and all of that, and especially the, the salary component, which is very, very critical for a pre-placement talk. But what about the roles? Right. Sorry, Ankit, I uh, lost you in the last two seconds. Uh, can you just repeat the last? No, I, 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 was just, I was just talking about in terms of how do students identify the roles and not so good parts of the company according to them. When, when I said that, like, hey, consulting is not for okay. everybody, okay. right? So how, how do I get to know that it is not for me? Okay. So I will uh, suggest that the first year in MBA is very, very critical. So uh, when you uh, go to the MBA colleges, there are a lot of preconceived notion that I want to get into this particular role, this particular company. And there is a automatic bias before you uh, even uh, actually explore the role. There is a preconceived notion, preconceived bias that I want to do this particular role, this particular location, this particular company. So I would suggest that you keep an open mind First year, there is a lot of networking opportunities that you get in the campus. So pre-placement talk is only, uh, you are correct, it's a 60 minutes, 90 minutes talk. But you have a full one year. You speak to a lot of uh, your seniors, you speak to your professors. In uh, B-schools, typically, there are a lot of workshops that is organized in most of the uh, colleges. For example, ICIC Bank also does a lot of uh, workshops in uh, various colleges. And typically, a lot of companies, most of the companies do that. So attend a lot of workshops. There are a lot of live projects which are in offering. You do a couple of those projects. You will understand nuances of what exactly the project is. You will interact with the people in the corporate. You will understand what exactly that means. So go with an open mind. Try to understand. Uh, there is a, of course, there is a wonderful tool like a LinkedIn where you can approach anybody. And particularly, uh, most of the alums of your uh, particular college will be pretty open uh, in uh, sharing all those details. Who has been in the industry for let's say five years, ten years, they will have a much more. Uh, they will come up with a much more open mind, and they will uh, share a lot of details. So use the first year to understand all those things. Summer internship, you take summer internship is a very uh, is a, uh, super important thing in MBA. Lot of people have seen, they before the summer internship, they have uh, some kind of notion that I want to do a trading job. I want to be a trader. But after you actually go and work there for two months, possibly you may not like that. Somebody who does not like markets, who does not like 
looking at the screen looking at what is uh, happening in the market may not like it for a very long period of time right so somebody uh, so markets for example is a different every day so today for example some trade was not making sense a week back now this week it will make sense after a week it may, might not work so you have to be super quick in execution you have to be extremely you have to follow the market very closely so some people may not like that some people may like a lot of traveling a trader job will not going to offer that and the vice versa somebody do, who do not like traveling at all will not like a consultancy job so i think it is important that you keep an open mind and speak to a lot of people your networking is the best thing that these b schools offer this is one of the most critical things that uh, everybody should try to uh, capitalize on this opportunity which not everybody gets and don't just wait for a ppt of 90 minutes yes that 90 minutes will give you a lot of insights of that specific company but yes that is tailor made so as so you need to speak to a lot of seniors who are already there in that organization so that is how we will get a much more holistic picture so sure. yeah your thoughts on this so i 100% uh, agree ankit with everything that's been said networking super important use your first year to the maximum right like you guys are going to have a blast anyway it's a great time to like it's a it's a great time of your life to be in b school right um you interact with all all sorts of new people you're learning things all the time and uh, you know the worst thing that could happen is you couldn't miss a deadline like you know it's a good phase of life and uh, networking is super important the one thing i will ask all of you to do is to be honest with yourself what i have seen it as the um sort of mentality that we sometimes go into these networking conversations is that oh my gosh uh, this job sounds super cool um so this is what i'm going to do like i want to be a banker and i want to have um, you know my deals up on wall street journal so two things for you kids right one is that you know the hit rate on anything right especially transactions that are that large are lower right so that's a lot of work and nobody will tell you that not every day there is your deal on wall street journal it's a lot of work and you might not even enjoy it and that's okay i feel like we don't tell people enough that that's okay to not enjoy a glamorous job and people fall into this trap of oh i want to do this really cool trading job and i'm going to be this and i'm going to be that if you have that clarity that's excellent but if you don't it is absolutely not necessary for you to think that that job is cool that job may be cool but it may still not be something you enjoy right so be honest with yourself if i personally enjoy training training a lot it is absolutely not cool to many people like like they like oh like i don't that's the last thing i want to do on my job right but i personally enjoy it a lot and i made sure that i was i put my hand up whenever there was an opportunity to train people on technicals in finance Okay. so you find yourself opportunities in areas of areas that you would like to work in and i think being you know getting that aspect of honesty for yourself is super important and i will reemphasize what shavik said use your first year and your summer internship like it is the most important time and again i'm talking from experience it's i have seen so many people go into internships uh because they got it and they're cool jobs but it's not something that you enjoy so much and then you know because it's a summer internship and we all know what the pressure is in b schools at that time you know day zero this is it you got to get a control room it's 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 tough right but you need to tell yourself at some point that it's okay to to go for a job that other people don't think is cool right so that's one thing and the second thing i want to say is summer internship use that time as much as a company is using to choose you and analyze and sort of assess your capabilities use that time to assess the company the firm that you're working for is this the place you want to work are they the right people to work with are they like are you working with smarter people every day are you learning something new right so just because you're there doesn't mean that you can't change after that right so be absolutely sure to use that time and i keep right is like telling everybody all the interns who come to goldman who I interact with use this time this place this place is excellent and i like you really have to appreciate how much your employers are doing for you and there is no better time than for summer internship it's literally the honeymoon right so make sure you use that time to assess the companies and if you're if you feel like 
there are things that should be done better, speak up or look for places that will address the specific needs that you have. So that's that's my two cents on this. Sure. Also, there have been many, many comments uh, uh, which sort of talk about, uh, let's say, the consulting firms uh, don't come to our campuses or the other firms don't come to our campuses. I think my response is uh, I mean, two points. One, uh, there are many other ways to actually get uh, PPIs and PPOs in some companies, and th those may not be on the panel today. Uh, but uh, there are uh, case study competitions wherein, uh, and not only case study, there are other opportunities as well, wherein when you participate, if you win, irrespective of which college are you from in terms of your target colleges, whether the, whether that company is going to that uh, campus or not, you still get an opportunity to get that PPI and PPO to ensure that that company notices your uh, college. They may not be coming to your college only because of uh, maybe resources. If they have only 10 openings and it is getting filled in those uh, five uh, colleges or so, why should they go to the sixth college? It's it's just the ROI, nothing else. It's not that they're saying that the talent is not, not great, but if they have to recruit 10, they have to basically stop somewhere. And the second element, I think Harsh will agree because... Uh, uh, Anshu, if 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 you know Ashu, sorry, Ashu, right, Harsh. So he yeah. he was he he participated in multiple competition because he was with us uh, last time around, uh, and he is currently in uh, McKenzie as well. What he also uh, talked about was that uh, competitions gave him a very very good point on different aspects of uh, different industries. He was winner of about four or five uh, certain. Uh, competitions or so and uh, he also mentioned i think if i'm not wrong that the the discussion during the interview also goes in that manner because as a consulting firm you may want a candidate who has shown those skills or who knows about different industries so that is one thing that you can also do uh coming to uh, the last thing in the interest of time i would want every panelist to basically uh, tell one advice to students which they think uh, needs to be uh, taken very, very seriously. And, and a, a skill that is now very, very necessary to excel in these times. We can start with you, Leah. Sure. So I think I've already given a lot of advice. <laughs> so I don't think, I don't know if I should go for another one. <laughs> but I think I'll just say again that uh, please use your first year very well. It doesn't mean you're to sit in, it definitely does not mean that you're to sit in front of a book all the time. Uh, get out, talk to people, uh, get to know industries, figure out what you would like to do. And that's my advice. Uh, in terms of uh, skill that is, uh, skill that's essential for success, right? So I would say that would be, if I can say two things, one is the ability to innovate, to be able to think outside the box, bring something new to the table. That's what gets you noticed, right? Um, even think about it at, at your level, right? When you're, right now when you're going in, you're at different levels, engineers, commerce, doctors, lawyers, everything. At the end of that, everybody sorts of, sort of levels out. You always need to think out of the box, bring something new to the table to get noticed. So keep that in mind. Uh, the second thing is resilience, especially in times like this, you need to be resilient. This means if today, like imagine companies which have 10, 15, 20,000 people have gone to, into work from home overnight. That is business resilience. Bring that on a personal level. That's going to be absolutely necessary, at least getting through the next year, year and a half for sure. So that's from me. Thanks. Thanks, Leah. Let me go to you, Shobhik. I absolutely agree with uh, what Leah said. Uh, so, uh, about the skill sets, uh, typically in industry, there are two things which are very important to success. One is attitude, the second is aptitude. Attitude is possibly given for the set of people who are going to the premier business schools. Uh, aptitude, sorry, aptitude is possibly given. What differentiates actually is the attitude. So, in industry, there is a you need to be passionate about your work so whatever you are doing you need to be you need to like that work so that is why the first year becomes very important you try to understand that what you are actually doing is it kind of matching with the kind of life you want you you have to you need to understand your lifestyle and then what the job role is whether these to match with each other so if that matches then only you will be passionate about that work so what it matters you need to be passionate about your work 
you need to be learn continuously the learning cannot stop at all so your learning has to be a absolutely con continuous process whenever you have stopped learning that is where there is a going to be a um, flattening in your uh, growth curve uh, so as to say so the learning has to be continuous process you have to acquire new skills every day the market is changing the industry is changing very very fast we are in a generation when the industry is changing at an absolute breakneck speed so you need to acquire new skills uh, as a continuous process you need to passionate about what you need to understand holistically what the business is and that's it so you will be able to do well in any any role you are into thanks thanks coming to you harsh your one advice Mm, my advice frankly during this kind of a covid scenario is basically put that effort into networking and do not consider it to be something which is just like you know i want a job i want to get more information from you that's that's it that's not the case just put some amount of effort into this relationship especially you know even if with it's within campuses a lot of those will go online for sure for the next few months at least so you might miss out on that Uh, bubbling enthusiasm that lia was talking about in the first year right but even then just put some amount of effort into actually connecting to people if nothing else and in terms of skill set just be curious i mean the moment you are curious enough the moment you ask questions be it the ones which are right or wrong doesn't really matter but the moment you start asking questions is when you actually understand what is the real thing out there what you are as well as what the things are out there so that would be my two pieces Uh, in terms of anything so thanks thanks ash karthik closing thoughts so my two cents will be first don't be afraid to stand out of the crowd in b school in b school it is very easy to just try just because everyone wants to do finance or consulting it's very easy to for you also to just try and do that why because everyone else is doing it must be right at the same time everyone might be just going gaga over some xyz company it is totally normal for you not to like find that company a right fit for you which is a totally normal thing it's okay it happens everyone has a unique interest and that's what that's what the what i think lia was mentioning that both the parties are evaluating each other and that's the right thing to do so please don't be afraid of that if you feel what decision you are taking or what choices you are making they have some basis they have some logical sense and they you are being honest to yourself please go ahead with it unabashedly and don't worry about what others will say the second thing and which i think a lot of even like when i was in my first year or even the first year of job i faced is sometimes we are too afraid to disagree or to ask questions if i just follow what harsh said please don't be afraid of that and it is even more easy uh, like a problem right now when most of the meetings are happening virtually so it is very easy to just like drift apart or like not being able to get the real face time to ask the right questions or to disagree if you have a valid point like don't disagree just to get noticed or that. but if you have a valid point and if you feel you might be wrong there is a high probability you might be wrong but at least you will realize why you are being, you are wrong and it will shape your thinking for the future but if you don't voice your thoughts voice your concerns or don't agree to disagree then it will not lead to any personal growth for you so these will be my two cents for the part right. which is coming up and let's last one last thought so i was just going through the chat i saw a lot of questions and a lot of times where my name was there and you guys wanted to ask me something and i think in the interest of time we couldn't take each and every question but yeah please feel free to drop a note on linkedin and i'll try to answer as many questions as possible so yeah feel free to do that okay thank thanks karthik so that that's for all for today tomorrow we have a we have a panel which wherein we'll only be talking about campus life uh what you should be doing in your two years uh, networking uh, committees how to get into committees case competitions we have place commerce tomorrow in our panel to basically give you an insight into how the recruitment will be in covid times from your college point of view so tomorrow session will be the last session of ignite season 2 and we have ensured that we we have the best still coming in the last session thank you so much thanks karthik thanks leah thanks shovik thanks harsh thanks for joining us uh, it was an insightful discussion i'm sure our viewers uh, loved it thank you so much for joining thank you thanks thanks okay thank you, thank you. Thank you.